It's uh, Richard Nadar from Christian Alliance International School. It's a great pleasure to join with you again uh, after our last introductory video where we just talked about uh, the, the whole idea of why we are doing Pilgrim's Progress. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Good to be back with you. Looking forward to another session with Richard and talking about John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Okay, good. So, um, you know, we pick on the story from session one and uh, we uh, we're going to uh, start the story with john bunyan dreaming about this whole uh, journey of him uh, going to the celestial city uh, what are the elements do you think are of the story yeah so maybe what i can do as we get started richard is just to kind of give a review of what the sections were that we covered so far and if you haven't had a chance go back and read the things that we're talking about don't just rely on us but for the story so far, what we've gotten to is it does begin, as Richard mentioned, with this dream. Uh, but it's really when he mentions the dream, that just sets up kind of the fantasy that's coming in the story. And just a real short summary of what's going on, because we're going to go into depth in a minute, is the story opens and there's a man. First, he's called Graceless. Later, he's going to be called Christian. Correct. And he realizes through reading a book, and what that book is, we'll talk about in a minute, but he realizes that the city he's living in is a city of destruction and that it is going to be destroyed. There's a danger coming and it's going to affect him and his family, everybody. And to make matters worse, he has a terrible burden, which is like strapped or tied to his back. He's in rags. He has this burden that he cannot get off. And so in this miserable situation, he's saying, how can I get rid of my burden? How can I escape the destruction of this city? And he starts to, to talk to people about it. And, and most of the people that he meets are making fun of him. Mm, yeah. uh, they don't really care or believe him. There's a few who do care. But even his wife and his kids, which is very cruel to him, mm. they mock him. They don't understand him. But the good news is he meets a man called Evangelist. And Evangelist tells him how he can escape that city of destruction, how he can get the burden off of his back. And so he starts to head out on this journey. And even as he begins, he encounters some difficulties, but also there's some excitement to push him on. But that's basically what we talk about today is as he leaves the city and the first start of some trouble that he gets into. Uh, he encounters a bit of difficulty and he has to get redirected one or two times. So that's the story. <laughs> And uh, in this process, um, you see uh, the Christian in his dream he talks about different characters mm -hmm. who he encounters. Now, uh, these characters, they have peculiar names. OK, so let me just give some of these names. So, so he meets a character named, named Evangelist. Now, the evangelist is the one who basically shows him the direction as to where he needs to flee. And then he meets this um, character named uh, two of them who follow with him. They are, one is called as the obstinate and the other one is pliable. Now, it's very interesting. We'll try to find out how do these uh, characters uh, follow with John Bunyan and where do they end up with. Uh, that's something uh, quite interesting. Uh, the fourth person is uh, uh, the person named Help, who actually is part of, um, you know, the uh, process of helping the pilgrim or, or you know, uh, the Christian continue in his journey because he does encounter an issue that he needs to now overcome. So these are the different characters. Now, uh, let's ask the simple question uh, what do these characters uh, wh why do you, why do you think uh, John Bunyan gives this peculiar name to these characters mm. yeah it's a good question and I, and I think the reason why he's doing it is to help us out a bit and also to make them memorable in our minds but the characters have these names because they either represent an idea uh, that's in our spiritual life or they represent a type of people uh, so in this way, whenever he introduces the person, even their name is going to let you know what they're like or what they represent. And then further, the way they act and the words they say will we'll tie those two together. So already you've got a hint when Richard mentions obstinate and pliable or help. That's telling you something about an idea or a type of person, a type of character that you're going to see. And again, they represent an idea or a type of people. It doesn't mean necessarily that there was a real person named obstinate in, in Bunyan's life or in your yeah, life and yeah. my life. So keep that in mind. Yeah, and I think we went through this in the intro introduction that this is an allegorical book. So which means that there are these images that has a representation to something in the Bible. So I think we will be able to look through the Bible to see what do these uh, allegories actually mean. Okay. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, Dr. Jonathan, now what's the, um, where is it, what is the symbolic meaning of some of these yeah. uh, things that John is talking about? Yeah. So we, I know Richard mentioned it earlier, one of the things that's important for us to remember is so many of the allegories and the characters are tied to biblical ideas and really this story, especially at the beginning, starts with a focus on the idea from the Bible of salvation. Uh, and the idea of being rescued out of not only sin, but its guilt, its condemnation, and also the punishment that is coming. And so it's a very biblical concept, but when it's applied to somebody's life, then it becomes a type of adventure or experience. Yeah. And so for John Bunyan, as he describes Christian, he's going to take this concept of sin's weight and sin's consequences and punishment, and then he's going to start about the process as a person realizes how to be saved and to be rescued, to be free of the burden, to escape the destruction that's coming. And this idea is a theme that begins here, but also, in a way, the idea of salvation, not just from sin's burden and its destruction, but also the positive aspects, mm -hmm. that it's going to help you go through your life, that it's going to let you deal with difficulties, it's going to change you into a new person, and ultimately bring you safe to the heavenly city, mm -hmm. to your heavenly home with God's presence. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the, the meta a narrative or the big theme that's going to go right. all the way through this book. Yeah. Um, and now the interesting thing to ask is this whole idea of the uh, vision or the dream of the burden. Mm -hmm. Now I know that John Bunyan in his own conversion experience have gone through a realization of sin, right? the burden of sin. Uh, and so how does uh, people across uh, human culture have learned to uh, be aware of that burden of sin? Now I remember the story of uh, Martin Luther. You know the uh, the person who is known for the Protestant Reformation. Uh, it is said that Martin Luther, when he was a monk, uh, it seems that he would go hours uh, for a time of confession. He would like confess even the smallest detail of things he has done wrong. And so um, he would somebody you know would call him as a gold bricker. Yeah. Okay, gold bricker is someone who would instead of doing his chores would spend time confessing his sin. Yeah. So they would say he's escaping from his uh, responsibility but the fact that um, that is interesting for us to note in this whole idea of burden is that realization that there is something wrong with you uh, it's not just a you know psychological aspect of you feel uh, something bad about yourself but but these characters that even with John Bunyan is it has to have a reference to a God who is a God of moral law that you have in some way broken that moral law and you feel guilt and sin uh, in terms of your attitude and behavior. Yeah. yeah, we can say that generally men and women around the world, no matter what, they may have a general idea of a creator God, that there's someone or something out there that's greater than them. Then also too, they may have a feeling, like you said, of, of guilt or realize that they're not perfect. I mean, maybe you're so proud, you never think that, right? But for most humble people, they realize they make mistakes and certainly other people do. But beyond this, what's common for Martin Luther and for John Bunyan and for lots of people throughout history is that they find out not only that there really is someone out there that they're accountable to, God, but through reading God's Word, they find out how serious their sin is. So it moves beyond this kind of existential crisis many people have and a sense of despondency or despair about just life as it is and their own self and the future, but it becomes very real and very concrete when they start to look into God's Word and see what God has to say about who we are right. and who He is. Right. And there's a very important stage to where when you first encounter God and His Word, and you really see yourself like in a mirror, then there can be a lot of discouragement, despair, because it's pointing quite strong to our our sin and our failure and the consequences of that. So yeah. that's really very big and important at the beginning of this. And then also too, particularly for the way the, the Puritans would talk about salvation in this time. Correct. Um, also the fact that the city of destruction um, I, I don't know how do we explain this, but I believe that the Bible tells us that this universe is in some way dying because of the sin of Adam and Eve. So right from creation, when God created everything, it was good. But but since the time sin came into the world through Adam and Eve, our universe, our this whole of creation is dying. So in that sense, uh, there is this futility and meaninglessness of a world uh, without God. 
you know and i was reminded of this uh, particular um, you know uh, book called as the myth of sisyphus mm -hmm. uh, by albert camus uh, the 19th century french uh, philosopher and he talks about the story of uh, sisyphus um, who is the king of corinth apparently was punished by the gods eternally to roll up this huge stone uphill and then all the way for you know let it roll down and then this process continues for eternity so the question is how does you know sisyphus navigates this futile or meaningless exercise now i don't want to go into the details but this is what albert camus says his conclusion is this that eventually uh, sisyphus has to believe or in the sense that he has to create his own meaning and so we have the city of destruction where people now has to create their own meaning uh, of carrying out their lives. And uh, is, is that's similar to what uh, King Solomon would say in the book of Ecclesiastic that vanity, vanity, vanity or meaningless, meaningless. So life without God in the city is meaningless. Yeah. You know, that's a reality. The topic of meaning in the city of destruction, if we let it represent the world without God, you've really got, exactly as Richard said, two kinds of people. First of all, you've got people who have created meaning for themselves, and they're just going along through life trying to make themselves happy. But then you do have other people, maybe like Camus himself, mm. uh, to where they realize and they begin to have this crisis to say, what is my meaning? Where is it coming from? Or then to see that all things are going to be ending someday, whether it be in the universe or in their own personal life. And so it's that type of situation that we face up to. And Christian, there's something about him that is different. And there's something that motivates him to seek uh, meaning that is going to last forever and is different from these man-made or, or woman-made personal meanings people. Okay, so now um, the Christian, um, as in his dream, now you know, wants to flee from the city of destruction to this celestial city. And uh, uh, he's uh, helped by the evangelist. Now, I, I, I read the story and uh, so the whole thing about uh, fleeing his family, away from his family or leaving his family, how does it sound to you? Yeah, this is really crucial, not only for understanding Bunyan's story, but also for a lot of people, their Christian experience. And when people read Bunyan's story and they see this, they're a little bit worried. And then also the same thing happens when you read your Bible, though, yeah. because Christian tries to get his family to be interested. He tries to talk to them about the book. He tries to tell them about the way that he's going to go. But they mock him. They try different things. They say, oh, you just need some sleep, go to bed. And so eventually he leaves and his family is crying out to him saying, don't go, don't go. And that's the famous scene where he puts his hands over his ears and he says eternal life and he's running away from his family. So there's two things I want to say about it. Number one is that if you go on and read the second book, the good news is, and I hope this doesn't spoil part of the story, a spoiler alert, okay? But the good news is eventually his wife and children do follow after him. Right. The second thing is this idea of abandoning his wife and kids. Please remember the story is an allegory. So it's not as if Bunyan in real life left his family. Correct. What it's saying is that spiritually speaking, you've got to go on whether or not your family comes with us. And if you live in countries to where Christianity is not the majority of you, you could face this in your life. Right. If you choose to become a Christian, you might have mothers or fathers or, or spouses or children to where they're saying, don't you dare become one of those crazy Christians. You know, we're going to disown you. Or are you going to break our hearts? Or who's going to give sacrifice after we die? And so the Bible also says, listen, if you love your family, if you love your wife, and even if you love yourself more than God, you can't go on in the right way. You can't have salvation. And that sounds harsh, but what you've got to remember is it's putting God in his proper places, number one. It doesn't mean you abandon your family in real life. In fact, Christian's going to find out and his wife later that he becomes a better husband and a better father because he makes this journey. Yep. Correct. Um, that's fantastic. Now, uh, I need to also make a connection here that when John Bunyan is talking about uh, the evangelist, I believe he's referring to uh, John Gifford, mm. the pastor of Bedfordshire 
County Church, mm. Baptist Church. Mm. Uh, so I think there is a connection and he reckons him as being a faithful preacher, somebody who shared the word and helped uh, John Bunyan in his own spiritual growth and maturity. So I, I do want to make that mm. connection. Uh, the other thing which is uh, equally important is this, that uh, we don't know who are the people in our lives who brings the good news. So if you can reckon that, uh, that uh, the feet of people who brings you the good news, that's the best thing. For John Bunyan, it was a life-changing experience. So uh, maybe you want to be more sensitive to the people around who brings this gospel of truth. You know? Uh, let's pick up the story. So you have um, John Bunyan fleeing from the city of destruction um, to what is called as the Wicked Gate. Do you have any idea of what is this Wicked Gate? Yeah, so it's it's a funny word that we don't use a lot anymore. The, the Wicked Gate is, is talking about kind of a very small and a humble and a very narrow gate. And Wicked would have been a type of material that wouldn't have been very nice, not like concrete or marble or ivory, but instead a simple and small and plain gate. Mm -hmm. So small and, and such poor material that lots of people would despise it. They'd say, why go that way? It's just a small, wicked gate. But this is also picking up what Christ had said about there being a narrow way mm -hmm. and few who come mm -hmm. through. Right. And then also later we'll talk about it, kind of the idea of humility mm -hmm. to go this way. Yep. That the call to follow Jesus is not a broad way. It's a very narrow exercise and very few people make it. Even Jesus himself said that. Mm -hmm. So as he travels through that, he takes along, I mean, say two people follow him. Uh, one is obstinate and one is pliable. Um, now, what is the application for us yeah yeah obstinate like pliable these two characters are kind of names and words we don't use much anymore so obstinate is almost like someone who's very stubborn and pliable someone who can be manipulated or moved and you're gonna be like this if you're already setting out on the Christian journey if you're considering it or you are a Christian you could probably look back in your past and see someone who was when they were in conversation with you stubbornly discouraging you mm -hmm. saying that they weren't gonna go along and when you try to share the gospel with them they're rejecting it stubbornly yeah. pliable we're going to see in a minute is more flexible but also too Richard and I were talking this also is a great illustration of that parable of the sower and the seeds where Christ had said sometimes the good news of salvation goes out and it just gets rejected it falls right away Satan or other things snatch away the truth other times it goes down a little bit springs up and dies away it doesn't last but obstinate and pliable kind of represent these two ideas very well and I will add there's two things that they lack when they're introduced. They don't have a burden on their back, right. and they don't have the book, right. which, by the way, is the Bible, Bible in their hand. So that's one of the differences we see in their lives. Yeah, when I think of the character obstinate, and um, I, I want to make a parallel here with uh, Plato's uh, book seven called as the Republic, mm -hmm. where actually Plato talks about a story or allegory. It's called as the allegory of caves. Now this is like 2,400 years ago, uh, and in the story, Plato is talking about a few men who were chained to a cave, to a dark cave, and all they could see. Uh, is the shadow, their own shadows on the cave. Uh, apart from that, they also could see other shadows of people outside walking or animals and they could try to guess different things. Uh, eventually it happens that uh, one of them, one of the prisoner uh, who escapes from the cave and he uh, sees that they are not shadows, they are real. There are people, real people, real animals, and uh, their shadows were being cast uh, on the cave. And so he looks at it and then finally looks at the sun that makes this shadow possible, and then the fire and all that. And then he goes back to the prisoners and tells them, hey, you know what, this is just shadow, this is not reality. You know, you got to see the real world outside. And he gets mocked by these prisoners and, and he, he's, uh, he's rejected, and uh, especially what he was talking about. And finally, they decided to remain there. So there are people just like the obstinate who probably hear the truth, they, they know what it is, but yet choose to walk in their own path. So that's the uh, character obstinate. So finally, obstinate decide to go back and then pliable continues with, uh, with the Christian. Yeah, so for pliable and Christian, it's quite nice because it, using Richard's uh, analogy with the, the uh, cave, it's as if he starts to go along the journey and he wants to know what's out there. He wants to know what kinds of things uh, Christian has read in his book and what's the destination like, which we could say heaven or the heavenly city. And so it's very nice if you haven't read the story yet, 
uh, Christian basically starts to share biblical passage with him about the glory of heaven, the, the wonder that's there, the transformation in our life, the beautiful company, most of all God, how he's going to wipe away tears from our eyes. So he's enticing him. He's telling him, listen to all this good stuff. Look what's there. And Pliable's yeah. amazed, and, and Pliable's doing a good job. He says, can we really get there? How are we going to go? Tell me more. Tell me more. And so that part of his character is good. It's positive. And it's better than obstinate that we just heard from. Yeah, exactly. So that's when, you know, the next thing happens. Pilgrim and the Pliable, they both now get stuck into what is called as the mighty clay. Yes. So uh, this is where you know things get difficult for Christian because he has the burden on his back. He starts sinking, but the Pliable doesn't have the burden on his back. So because he has no awareness of anything about sin, wrongdoing, uh, behaviors, attitude, he's not con convicted of any of those things. So he's able to get out of that. And uh, uh, having seen these kind of difficulties, he decides to go back to the city uh, where he comes from. Whereas the pilgrim now, you know, gets stuck in the mighty clay. What do you think happens? Yeah. So this this place, which sometimes people call it a, a slough or a slough of despond, it's really like a, a pit or a puddle, like you say, of miry clay and just despair. And as they're walking along, what it's supposed to picture, I think, is that for Christian especially, and even for Pliable, as they start to realize uh, what the Bible says about our guilt and our wrongdoings and our sins are so bad, especially for Christian, he falls into it and he's miserable. And he can't get out and he feels stuck and he's being poured down by the guilt. And, and Pliable's there a little bit. He doesn't like it. In fact, he makes fun of him and says, is this what you promised me? If this is the beginning of the journey, how bad is the rest going to be? But for Christian, he's weighed down by his conviction and his consciousness of sin and his burdens, and he can't find a way to get out. Pliable does, and that's when Pliable makes his way back home. And this kind of represents, again, somebody who starts in a good way, and then when the going gets tough, they run home Correct. and they give up. Okay, so as the Christian now is able to get out of the slough of death bond, uh, what we want to do now is uh, bring a closure. And, but we want to bring a closure with understanding how does it all apply to being a Christian, right? And I think uh, there are multiple things here, right? The whole idea of the realization of sin, your burden, and the idea of uh, repentance, and the idea of uh, you know seeking for help and faith in Christ. So there's this multiple things that are happening here. Um, what do you think about this, uh, uh, what do you call the process of uh, you know, repentance? Mm. Yeah, that's a great uh, idea that's given to us in the Bible. And it's something that sometimes gets missed or neglected today because nobody wants to make each other feel uncomfortable. And if you come to a person and say, there is a God, He's holy, you're unholy, you're lost, you're in sin. Nobody likes that kind of language, but it's very biblical and it's what we need. And so in this situation, just like the Bible says, as Bunyan gets to hear the Word of God and it points out who God really is, who He is, then the, the grace of God in his life is letting him see that there's a conviction of sin. He realizes what he's done, that he's fallen short of the glory of God. And so what also comes is there's a desire in him to turn away, right? To turn from his old sinful past and to turn to God. I think we'll uh, end here because our time is up and uh, it, it's been a great journey so far with John Bunyan. We look forward to joining you again uh, for the next session. Till that time, have a good weekend. See you. Bye.